Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on the 2018 Macy's Faculty Scholar Program. My name is Peter Goodwin. I'm Chief Operating Officer and Treasurer here at the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation in New York. The purpose of today's web conference is to provide you an opportunity to hear from the principals involved with the Macy Faculty Scholars Program. We will share with you the program's vision and highlights, as well as the application and selection process. Our agenda today is two parts. First, we'll have a brief presentation, which will then be followed by a lengthy question and answer period. At the end of the question and answer period, we'll spend our last minute on some details you'll need to know in order to submit your online application. This webinar is being recorded. You will be able to view the slides and listen to the presentation and the question and answer portion of the webinar on our website within the next week. For any questions you have during today's presentation, you can use the chat function on your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end of the prepared remarks. And if for any reason you need technical assistance during this webinar, you may contact ReadyTalk, our conference provider, at 800-843-9166. For those of you using social media during the webinar, please use the hashtag MacyScholar2018. And now I would like to introduce the president of the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, Dr. George Tebow. Let me add my welcome to Peter's. Uh, we are so uh, excited by the interest in this program across the nation. We are very proud of this program, started in 2010, and this will be our eighth cohort. The program vision from the beginning has been to recognize and nurture the careers of educational innovators, to identify mid-career faculty that have shown great promise, and I want to emphasize the fact that this is a career development program. It is not just a project grant. We're identifying people who we think will benefit most from this program in the development of their career to have impact over a long period of time beyond the period of funding uh, of the uh, uh, fellowship itself. The program will provide protected time mentoring in a national network of similarly aligned scholars. And the goal is to create educational change at the institutional level and to create a national cohort of leaders and educational innovators who will create educational change at the national level. The program highlights are that it provides at least 50% protected time to pursue a mentored educational project at the home institution of the scholar. All scholars participate in the annual meeting of the Macy Faculty Scholars Program. All scholars are mentored by national advisory committee members as well as their local member at, at mentor in their institution. All scholars will participate in one or more Harvard Macy Institute programs at Harvard, and all scholars will have access to other Macy grantees and programs. I will emphasize during the first year of the program, all of the scholars are required to uh, enroll in Harvard Macy Institute's program for educators in the health profession unless they've already taken that program, in which case they have an option to take another Harvard Macy program. And in the second year, uh, all have an opportunity to take a second program as well. <clears throat> The eligibility criteria are that all candidates must be doctorally prepared and a member in good standing in a sponsoring school that is either a school of nursing or a medical school. All must have served for five or more years as a faculty member, ideally at the sponsoring uh, school. In the past seven years, successful candidates have often had more than five years of experience at the time of application. They must be nominated by the dean of their nursing or medical school, and there can be no more than one 
nominee per nursing school or medical school. And the nursing school or medical school that currently has a first year scholar is not eligible to submit a nomination in that year, but are uh, eligible in subsequent years. All applicants must have an identified faculty mentor. All must have an educational innovation project and all must be a citizen or permanent resident of the United States or its territories. The application itself involves a state career objectives and personal goals, and this is a very important part of the application. Why does this fit into the career development plans of the applicant? How is their career one that is committed to educational innovation? They must then describe the project that they're going to undertake at their institution under the direction of their mentor. They must have a nominating letter from their dean of their school, a nominating letter from their mentor indicating the mentor's uh, ability and willingness to take on this mentoring role, a letter from their department chair, and a letter from one or two other senior faculty members. If the applicant's project is an interprofessional project, then one of those letters should be from at least one other discipline that's involved in the interprofessional project. And we should emphasize that we want the letters of support to speak to the career development potential of the candidate and why this particular award will be critical to them in their career pathway. Also included in the application is a current CV of both the candidate and the mentor. The selection criteria are that there must be evidence of a strong career commitment to education. I want to emphasize the importance of this. This is not an opportunity for somebody to, who's thinking about doing something in education to get their first trial run at it. We're looking for people who already have an established record as an educator and educational innovator and that this will be a catalyst to their career. So we look for that evidence of strong career commitment. They've all, we want each candidate to have already shown early promise as an educator and leader, which is why we require that there be some faculty time already to have demonstrated uh, this promise. We look for evidence that they've been innovative and creative in their career today. We evaluate the merit of the educational innovation project. Does it show promise uh, for uh, helping to bring about innovation not only in their institution but elsewhere. Do we think it's feasible? Is it important? We look for evidence for strong institutional support and for the environment in which the candidate is working because that's going to be very important for their success and for the impact that we hope that the candidate is going to have, not only with their project but in their further career development as an educational leader and innovator. We have an extensive selection process. Um, all of the applicants are reviewed by senior staff at the Macy Foundation, and the staff select semi-finalists that are then reviewed by our, our very distinguished National Advisory Committee. From that group of semi-finalists, the National Advisory Committee selects a group of finalists, and those finalists are invited for interviews by the National Advisory Committee and senior Macy staff. Those interviews for this cohort will occur uh, on June 18th and 19th, 2018, in New York City at the Macy Foundation. And scholars will be notified by June 22nd, 2018, to begin their time as a Macy faculty scholar by September 1st, 2018. So just to review key dates, uh, the final deadline for the receipt of application is February 14, 2018 by 3 p.m. Eastern Time. By, by April 25th, we will have notified the finalists. 
The interviews in New York will occur June 18th and 19th, 2018. Notification will occur on June 20th, 2018. And the scholar's tenure will begin on September 1st, 2018. So let me pause there. And we'll, we'll have time to review um, questions that have been submitted. And uh, Peter will uh, call out and uh, triage those questions. And I will try to answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you, George. Once again, please use the chat function uh, to submit questions to us. And we'll triage them. And I will read them out for George to respond to. So George, here's the first question. Does the faculty mentor have to be from the same institution as the applicant? Uh, no, uh, does not have to be. And we've had uh, uh, mentors who were either at another health professional school in, in the same um, academic institution. And those have worked out well. And then we've had some mentors who were at other uh, institutions. There's a, a need for the mentor to not only know the candidate and know the project, but also to be helpful in career advice and career development. I want to emphasize that, that the mentor is not just a project mentor, but is a career advisor mentor. So the mentor needs to know enough about the, both the discipline of the uh, scholar, but also the institution of the scholar to be helpful to them. So that's an important issue in selecting the mentor, but does not have to be from the same institution, though there is some value in having a mentor from the same institution. Continuing with the mentoring line of questions, George, can an applicant have more than one mentor? Yes, but there should be one principal mentor. There needs to be one person that really is taking charge of both coordinating, overseeing the project, as well as, as giving the kind of uh, career advice. But we have had uh, uh, successful candidates with more than one mentor. Uh, but we do ask that there be a single designated principal mentor. And for instance, at the first annual meeting of the, uh, that the scholars attend of the Macy Faculty Scholar Program, scholars come with their mentor. And so there's one mentor that comes with them. So one person is designated as a principal mentor, but there can be other mentors as well. George, are PhD faculty encouraged to apply, or is the focus on clinical faculty? No, PhD faculty can apply. We've had uh, 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 several successful um, applicants and several of our current uh, Macy Faculty Scholar alumni are uh, PhD uh, in education or in other fields. Uh, but they have to be a faculty member of a medical school or nursing school and have to be the choice of that medical school or nursing school as the person that they want to nominate. Concerning the 50% protected time, is there a minimal amount of hours of commitment required? No, we don't do it by hours. We do it by um, uh, commitment, really. And we do ask for a letter uh, from the uh, dean and department chair indicating that, that uh, a 50% allocation of time, usually on a salary allocation basis, is being protected, that we are uh, uh, providing from the Macy Foundation in the expectation that that is truly protected time. But we don't count it by hours. It's very difficult, given very different kinds of faculty commitment, to make this an hourly commitment. It's a conceptual commitment as we look at the time allocation and responsibility allocation of the faculty member. Regarding the project that's funded under the Macy Scholars Program, does the type of educational program matter? Could it be patient-directed, or should it be directed at other health professionals? 
Well, the, the education that we are involved in is the education of health professionals. Uh, and uh, much of that involves patient care and may involve patient engagement and involvement in that, but the um, focus of our activities is the education of health professionals, broadly defined across the continuum of health professions education. So the target are learners in the health profession. Regarding the statement of, of personal goals and career objectives, which is part of the application, could you speak a little bit more about what you mean by personal goals? Well, we're interested in where the candidate thinks they're going. What, what, do, they, what do they aspire to? Um, and how does this fit into that plan and how will this accelerate the plan? So we would like to hear from each of the candidates as to their view of their own career trajectory and aspirations and how, this may, how and why this makes sense for them as part of a career plan. Now, I understand full well that none of us knows for sure what we're going to end up doing, but um, we want to hear the, each candidate's um, uh, best uh, vision of where their career is going, where do they want it to go, and why would this make sense uh, to help them achieve uh, their career vision and their career goals. Will individuals know if they have been identified as semifinalists? Uh, yes, we, we let uh, uh, the, the individual know and the school know that uh, uh, a candidate has been selected as a semifinalist. Could you give us any examples of prior projects? Oh, this, that's very difficult to do. The projects run a huge gamut, uh, and uh, you can, uh, it, it's very difficult. You can look at our, our funded priorities for the Macy Foundation on our website, because the projects tend to come within the boundaries of those, but those are pretty broad. So uh, we're interested in innovation and in the education of health professionals uh, across the spectrum. Uh, and uh, so... I think you can look at things that we have funded by the Macy Foundation and get some idea of the spectrum of things. So one applicant wants to know, could two, two people share a Macy Foundation Scholar Award? No, absolutely not. This is a single career development award. Again, it's not a project award. There is a project within it. But we are interested in developing careers, and that means the individual career of somebody chosen, and that person remains part of the Macy family for the rest of their career. So we're focusing on individual career development. Regarding the candidate, does a prospective candidate need to have an established research or educational project trajectory and have received prior grant funding? Uh, prior grant funding is not required, uh, but there needs to be a, a clear track record that the person is, is invested in education and has done both creative things and leadership things in education. We're not looking for this being a career changing award. If somebody's done something else and now wants to change their career to get into education. So we're looking for a track record in education. Grant funding is one manifestation of a track record, but not the only one. Uh, but there needs to be evidence that the person has done something in education that is creative, involved leadership. It could be course development. It could be curriculum development. It could be writings and presentations. It may or may not have been prior grant funded. You mentioned mid-career faculty. Would late career faculty be considered? Well, this is a career development award that we are looking to have impact over the next several decades. So we really are aiming for mid-career people who have a trajectory ahead. We're investing in people's career for the long run. And uh, that's why we've identified it as mid-career. Is it possible to use the funding to support personnel costs? No, we are supporting the individual. We're buying the protected time of the individual. 
There is some additional money available for their own career development uh, to travel to attend meetings. But we are supporting the individual to protect their time to do the project and to devote themselves to their career development. If the applicant has a project that involves several fields of medicine, does the applicant need a letter from someone in each of those fields? No, uh, but there should be something uh, in the letters of support to represent the knowledge of that and at least some representative letter outside of their own field. But no, we don't, we don't want to get too many letters, uh, so that, but there needs to be some way in which the, uh, 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 the support outside of their own direct field is represented uh, in their letters. Can a pharmacy faculty member with an appointment at a school of medicine or nursing apply? If the dean of that school of medicine or nursing wants to make that person their one and only candidate, yes, uh, they have to be seen as so central uh, to that school that they would uh, make that person their candidate, and that certainly is possible. But it's the decision of the dean of that school uh, uh, what the centrality of that person is to their educational programs. Can the dean or a center director, for example, serve as the scholar's mentor? Yes, if that person is willing and able to commit uh, the time and attention required, uh, yes. Could the Macy's Scholar Award Funds be used to hire a graduate student or to pay for some graduate student costs? No, uh, the, the award is salary support for the faculty scholar to protect their time. We're absolute about that. Now, that might free up other money that could be used for that, but the Macy money is specifically for salary support of the scholar. If the project is an interprofessional project, can it involve other professions out of, outside of health, for example, ministry? Uh, yes, uh, we would be interested in innovative projects that uh, involve professions outside of health. Uh, again, the case would have to be made of why uh, this is a necessary innovation and support from that uh, other uh, field would need to be demonstrated. Um, if there's a situation where the faculty applicant does not have a chair but has a direct supervisor, um, could that person write the chair letter? Uh, yes, but mo most faculty members are a med have, have to be appointed as a member of the department. So whoever is the departmental appointing person, if it's not called a chair, but it is, it's the person with appointing and promoting authority uh, that we're interested in the letter from. Uh, and uh, so faculty members are part of some uh, academic structure within the institution that is responsible for appointments and promotion. That's the person that we want the letter from. And in that situation, could that person also be the mentor for the scholar? Person could be the mentor as well, yes. So if both the medical school and the school of nursing are on the same campus, can each school submit a unique nominee? Yes, and they don't even have to be on the same campus. So a medical school and a nursing school within the same university structure each have, have the opportunity to submit a, a, a candidate. Do you give any priority to um, interprofessional education projects over those that might focus only on one health profession? No, we're very interested in interprofessional education, but we're, we're most interested in picking the best people mm -hmm. that are likely to have the greatest impact. So while a significant number of the projects have been interprofessional, they're not required to be interprofessional. And successful candidates have had uniprofessional projects as well. And could a project focus on global health education, especially across clinical backgrounds? Is that possible? Uh, it is possible. Uh, we, have, we have not funded um, 
project internationally. So, and that's just a funding decision of what we've decided to do with our resources. But if the project involved um, the teaching of principles and issues of global medicine domestically, uh, then, then it could certainly be within our priorities. But we do not support international health professions education, that is, um, transporting people to educate health professionals elsewhere. Regarding the scholars faculty mentor, is it more important that they be an expert deep in a content area or could it also be a mentor on general career development? Well, they should have in some ways both uh, enough content expertise to uh, give advice about the project uh, as well as uh, to give meaningful career advice. But we are particularly want to emphasize the career advice and career development role of the mentor. So it does go beyond project supervision, but they have to have enough uh, knowledge of the field to be helpful uh, to uh, advance the uh, project as well. Does the scholarship award include allowance for any equipment that might be needed for an educational innovative project? Uh, we have funds in the uh, award, in addition to salary, for career development. Those are funds, by and large, used for travel, attendance and meeting, and sometimes other course participation. So given that those funds are limited, uh, it would not cover very much in the way of equipment. There may be small expenses that might be able to be included in that. But if there's expensive uh, uh, equipment needs, those would have to be funded elsewhere, either by the institution or by, the, by other funding. And of course, one of the tests of feasibility will be, uh, does the candidate and institution have the resources to pull off the project as described? How many applicants on average, do, does the Macy Foundation get to award five scholar awards each year? Uh, we get between 70 and 80 applications a year. So we're very gratified by the interest in this and, of course, the very high quality of the applicants we get. Regarding the proposed project from a scholar applicant, could it involve free medical education? We have not done very much in pre-medical education. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to rule it out. But we certainly are interested in uh, uh, improving the number of uh, underrepresented minorities in medicine, and we've previously not, through our scholars directly, uh, supported work in that. Uh, the reason we've not gone heavily into pre-medical education is that it's a huge field unto itself. And with uh, limited resources, we felt that we could have less impact there. Um, so I'd be cautious about that. I wouldn't want to say never, uh, but a case would have to be made why this was really special and that we were in a position to actually influence it in an important way. Regarding eligibility, if there is a medicine first year scholar could a nursing scholar apply this year? Yes, those are separate schools, so it's, it's school specific. So if, if within the same university structure, there's both a medical school and a nursing school, and there's a first year medicine scholar, then there can be an applicant uh, that the dean of the School of Nursing can put forward, yes. George, could you speak a little bit more about the five years of experience that we're looking for in the program? The, adjunct teaching time count? Well, what counts is meaningful faculty involvement. And again, there's enough variation in how appointments are used that it's sometimes hard to tell by an appointment. But we're looking for evidence that this person has been fully engaged as a faculty member, enough to demonstrate evidence of promise, enough to put them in a position that they can have impact so we're really looking for the evidence that this has been meaningful experience, that it's given them a track record and a, and a promise for the future. 
So if it's part-time status, that's less likely uh, to fulfill that uh, bill, or a case would have to be made of why this is uh, um, the kind of uh, evidence that we're looking for of both accomplishment and potential for impact. So if somebody is relatively new on the full-time faculty, it might be advice to wait until you've developed that track record. So we understand that you can't have a scholar um, from a school that already has a first-year scholar, but what if an applicant is from a school that had a scholar in a previous year? Would that in any way affect their chances? Yeah. No, not at all. They're, we encourage uh, uh, that school to uh, keep submitting applicants. Is there a particular format that the personal statement, part of the application, and proposal should follow, such as that of an NIH grant? Uh, no. I mean, we, we do have a format for the whole application that you'll see online. But that personal statement should be what we say, a personal statement. Uh, I'd say the most impactful personal statements are when people talk about themselves. Uh, and that may be a little more personal than one would look for in an NIH application. So we want to we get to know you as much as we can on paper. Uh, so I would encourage you to do your best to let us know what you've done that you think is special, what you aspire to do that you think is special, and why this would make a difference to you in a very personal way. The only other thing I would add to that from a technical point is while there's not a structure, there is a limit. Um, and it equates to about three pages for your personal statement and three pages for your um, project description. Is the funding for the Macy Scholar Award portable if for some reason the candidate would move to another institution during the period of their award? We'd have to review that on a case-by-case -case basis. We've had, we've had no scholar yet move during their award period. And, uh, we actually would hope that wouldn't happen because we're really looking first to have impact locally at an institution. We've picked this person in this institution with this mentor in this environment. Uh, it's very hard, particularly for the kind of work that we want to support, which is educational innovation and in many ways culture change, uh, to think that a scholar could pull up stakes halfway through and, and do that in another institution that they are brand new in. It's not quite like having a laboratory experiment where maybe it wouldn't matter so much where you did it. So it, it, it's so far unprecedented and we would have to review it on a case-by-case -case basis. Here's a question about the uh, protected time and the fungibility of the, of the, the salary support. If for some reason the candidate could have their time um, funded through other means, could that protected time salary be used for something else? No. Protected time, the salary is used for protected time. The fungible money comes in working with your department chair or dean about whether other money that is being saved for that could be used for something else. We're very adamant about this. And that's, to me, been one of the successes of this program. This is to support faculty to protect their time. As soon as we start parsing that out, then we no longer are buying the faculty's time. That's what we're buying, and that's extremely important to us. Is there any concern if the applicant is from a teaching intensive as opposed to a research intensive school of nursing? We are looking for people who hold the greatest promise of having impact as educational innovators, uh, and that's what we judge it by. Uh, and so uh, that, that's really the question we'll ask. Is this a platform that uh, will give this person uh, the opportunity to have national uh, visibility and influence, and is this an environment in which they can flourish? Uh, we don't look at the NIH uh, ranking uh, to, as our criteria for that decision. So we heard earlier, George, that on average the program receives about 70 to 80 applicants each year. How many of those are semifinalists 
um, that are chosen. It varies from year to year, but it's usually in the low 30s become semifinalists, and then the number of finalists has ranged between 10 and 12, out of which, which, which we pick the, the five scholars. So here's a question from someone who wants to learn about past efforts of previous and as well as active Macy grantees so that they can better understand the work of the Macy Foundation. Where should they go? You can go to our website where you'll see a, a, a description of the Macy Faculty Scholars as well as descriptions of the uh, other grants given by the Macy Foundation. And uh, you can get a sense from that of what our granting priorities uh, have been and are today. Regarding applying to the program, is there an application fee? No application fee, no. How would the foundation manage a situation when 50% salary effort is not covered by the $100,000? Uh, we have to negotiate that with the school, but we ask that the, uh, we are expecting that the, uh, uh, that we're getting 50% of the person's time. Sometimes we get more, um, but a minimum requirement, and when the school puts up the candidate, they know those are the terms, that we're expecting the 50% protected time for that $100,000. As I say, sometimes we get more than that. Regarding the Macy Faculty Scholars Mentor, are there any specific requirements in terms of time or attention or activities that are required of them during this period? Uh, we expect them to be available to the scholar. Uh, we don't specify the number of hours that that means, uh, but we do expect them to be available both for oversight and, and for advice, and that they're meeting with them regularly, but we don't specify the frequency of those meetings or the hours. We leave that to uh, each dyad to work out uh, to what's most effective for them. If someone is unsuccessful in applying to be a Macy Faculty Scholar, could they apply again in future years? Yes, we have uh, many reapplications. I would say in every pool of applicants, there's 10 to 20 percent of them are reapplications, and we've certainly had some successful uh, reapplications as well. Regarding the, um, the applicant school from which they are nominated, is there any consideration given to the size of the institution? No, I, I go back to my earlier answer. We're looking for the environment that will allow the candidate to flourish, to have the kind of career we want, and, and the platform that it would provide for them to uh, have visibility and impact on the national scene. And for the letters of support that are part of the application package, um, could one of those letters come from a senior faculty member that might be in another department? Yes, it could. And if an applicant has been appointed on the faculty for more than five years, but only been working in professional education for three years or so, would they still be able to apply? Yes, but we'd want to look and see, if, you know, whether, you know, again, we're looking at track records. So if they're so new into education that they've had little time to demonstrate uh, impact or a, a, a promise, uh, then they might want to wait uh, because the competition's stiff, as I said. And we're looking for people who already have an established track record in education and are clear, clearly on a career pathway, not just a temporary diversion, but a career pathway to be a career educator. So if it's a relatively recent um, uh, commitment to education, even though it's felt to be long-term, then that candidate might want to wait to demonstrate uh, that they're uh, in a longer-term investment on an educational career. Does the faculty mentor for the scholar receive any compensation or do they get any release time? No, uh, not 
not paid for by the Macy Foundation. Again, that's a, a local issue as to whether the institution thinks that this is important enough and prestigious enough. Uh, the faculty, the mentor gets the uh, recognition of being the mentor for a Macy faculty scholar, gets invited to our annual meeting, uh, but there's no direct compensation from the Macy Foundation for the mentor. If an applicant would achieve the semifinalist stage and possibly even the finalist stage but not receive an award, does the Macy Foundation provide any feedback to that applicant? No, that's impossible for us to do given our, uh, the size of our staff. Uh, uh, so we ask that um, they would have to get their um, feedback from their uh, own mentor and, uh, and in considering a reapplication. I can say the general advice we've given people if you're going to reapply, uh, don't reapply with exactly the same application. We do save applications. Um, it gives some demonstration of growth uh, between first and second time uh, and gives some evidence of even, even further accomplishment so that the time between first and second application may be more than a year uh, so that it demonstrates that there's been further development, not only in the candidate, but for often in the project idea itself. So that's our general advice about uh, uh, unsuccessful candidates who might consider reapplying. Must you be a full-time employee to apply, or could you, a half-time person or a part-time person, apply for the Scholar Award? Well, given our aspirations for this, it would probably be difficult for a part-time person to compete. We're looking for people who are going to be national leaders in health professions education and have impact both locally and nationally in changing it. In my estimation, it would be difficult for a part-time person to compete and to fulfill our expectation of this national impact. Could you speak again to mid-career? Um, we have a question from someone who is a faculty member and may be retiring in a 10-year time frame. Um, is that acceptable? Well, I wouldn't want to ever say absolutely, but we are hoping for more than a 10-year time frame uh, out of our scholars. Uh, we are looking to have impact over a long period of time. Uh, and we don't specify age because people have arrived, started their careers at different times and there are different career pathways and trajectories and we're very appreciative of that. But we are looking for people that are going to have impact over as long a period of time as, as possible and that will be a factor in comparing one candidate versus another. For the um, letters of support that come from senior level faculty members for the scholar's application, is there any minimum rank that you're looking for? Well, all the successful applicants have been at least an assist. Oh, for, for the oh, mentor. And mentor. Letters of support. Oh, the letters of support should generally come from senior people. Uh, so we're looking for people who are in a position. Uh, to comment on where this candidate stands in the long spectrum of faculty and their assessment not only of the quality of the work they're doing but their assessment of their future potential. So in general, uh, that kind of assessment that carries weight comes from more senior people. Uh, but we don't specify rank, but it's experience and seniority and breadth of experience of the people writing the letters that we're looking for. The uh, reviewers, as part of this process, you mentioned that the initial applications will be reviewed by the senior staff here at the Macy Foundation, which includes both you and me. Um, how about the re other reviewers for this award? Can you speak to them? Well, you can see on our website, the, I'm not going to go through the individual credentials of our NAC, National Advisory Group, but it's an extremely distinguished group of people uh, from nursing and medicine that whose names would be 
recognized by anybody in the field. And it's a, a remarkably distinguished and committed uh, group of people who give their all to this effort. You can find their names in the program's brochure, which is also on our website. Could you speak to what is a, might be an acceptable track record in education? Specifically, could it be something like course or curriculum development, or, or should it be represented more, more by prior academic publications? Well, we're looking for both, uh, but we don't have a, we do not have a minimum a publication number, but we do look for publication record as one measure of impact. We look at speaking invitations, we look at positions held, all of those things in a composite. Uh, but we're looking for some marker of, of scholarly accomplishment uh, that has been recognized locally and at least beginning to be recognized outside the institution as well. If an applicant is unsuccessful um, applying as a Macy Scholar, are there other opportunities through the foundation for collaboration? Well, we have grant programs, uh, uh, both presidential grant program and uh, board grant program, so applicants for this are uh, also eligible to apply uh, uh, for grants as well. Uh, but it would be a separate application process. This application doesn't automatically go into any other process. So the candidate would need to independently uh, apply for other grant support uh, uh, as described again on our website of our, our program descriptions. I would also add that you could um, follow us on LinkedIn or on Twitter. Um, we have a LinkedIn page and if you uh, register there we'll review that and you can join the Macy family as a way to sort of collaborate with the extended group of people and organizations that we work with. Regarding the, um, the support, the financial support under the award, George, is the 100000 in salary for protected time, and what about money for fringe benefits, specifically? Peter, do you want to answer that? Yes, there, um, the award is structured in such a way that it is up to $100,000 each year for a minimum of 50% protected time, plus fringe benefits as well. And we cap the fringe benefits each year at $30,000. So the award and the fringe benefits could be $130,000. In addition, George mentioned there is a small amount of money that's used for career development, approximately $15,000. We have two final questions, and then we'll, uh, we'll conclude the webinar. Can there be separate applications from nursing and medicine in the same year, or does the university have to decide to nominate one? No, there can be, uh, and uh, we encourage it. So each school has one, and uh, medicine and nursing can have a, a candidate in the same year, absolutely. George, would it be appropriate for any letters of recommendation or support to come from senior health systems personnel, like a hospital CEO or chief nursing officer, who would have knowledge of the applicant's potential for career impact? Uh, yes, that would be appropriate if, again, the nature of the candidate's career and the nature of their project involves uh, that kind of intersection uh, with the health system. Uh, it would be quite appropriate to have a, a letter of recommendation from the system executive. We have one final question. Should the applicant have a history of educational scholarly activity versus a scientific or clinical activity? Well, we're looking for evidence of educational scholarship and innovation. So, and uh, that you know, obviously there's sometimes some overlap between the two, but if all the person's track record up to this time is either a, a laboratory one or a clinical care one, both of which we acknowledge are very important, and there's no track record in education per se, that would not be as competitive uh, uh, an application. Well, thank you, George, and thank all of you who stayed on the line with us and asked a number of terrific questions. We appreciate your interest uh, in the program and look forward to many of you submitting applications.
Uh, just some final housekeeping notes. I posted the wrap-up slide. Uh, we are utilizing an online application for this program. If you have not already done so, you must first go to our website under the Macy Faculty Scholars section to register. Your email address and a unique password that you create will be your identifier and will allow you to start an application to the program. Now throughout this process, you may save and return to the application as often as you like prior to actually submitting it. To get started, once again, just visit our website, click on the Macy Scholars tab, and then click on the link that says apply. As part of the application process, you will also need to get your tax identifier for your school, whether it's the School of Medicine or the School of Nursing, as part of the registration process. If during the application process you have questions, you may email us at info at MacyFoundation.org. But before you email us, we encourage you to view the frequently asked questions that are posted on our website under the Macy Scholars tab. As since the program's announcement, a number of people have called or emailed us with their questions. And we've posted those questions with answers that we believe will be most helpful. We will continue to update the frequently asked questions throughout the open application period up to February the 14th. And finally, as a reminder, by next week, this session, both the audio portion and the slides, will be available on our website. Thank you for participating and have a good day.